Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on the Best of Oklahoma Gardening, we'll be looking back on a few of the highlights from our tour of gardening in northwest Oklahoma. In Woods County, host Casey Hinches talks with Greg Heifel about changes in plant life after the recent wildfires. We visit a new demonstration garden at the Garfield County Extension Center. Over a million bats fly over our heads at the Selman Bat Cave, and we find out how the settlers utilize turf to provide shelter from the harsh conditions of the Oklahoma Prairie. Today I'm walking out of the original sod house at the original sod house museum operated by the Oklahoma Historical Society and joining us today is Renee Trindle who is the director here and Renee we wanted to look at sod in a completely different way can you tell us a little bit about the sod house and how old it is well it's 123 years old and it took one half acre of sod to build it one half acre of sod cut four inches thick is 96 tons of sod that's a lot of weight behind yes us here. that's a lot of weight and of course, Marshall McCulley had to go ex actually a mile north of here to a low valley area abundant with buffalo grass. And again, each block being 18 inches long and 12 inches wide and 4 inches thick. This particular sod house is said to be quite luxurious for the fact that it's two rooms instead of one, but wow. especially the fact that it does have glass windows in it. Yeah. And total cost was $6.86. And that was a rich house back then, Yes. Right? Now on the inside, it doesn't look like the outside. It doesn't, you don't see those sod bricks. What did he do on the inside? Well, this one is very uptown because most sod houses were nothing more but mudded in. However, alkali clay is abundant in this area and he understood the value of the clay went down along the creeks and rivers collecting it, plastered these interior walls with clay, sealing them completely off, so therefore there has never been any interior deterioration, only exterior. Wow. And the blue inside the first room, that's not blue paint, but Mrs. McCulley wanted her home unique, so she had Marshall add bluing to the alkali clay to create her blue walls. Okay. And you have a roof of sod also. Is that um, yes. what we would typically find on top of a sod house? Well, this roof... Uh, was originally, a roof was originally 12 inches thick and of course today you're looking at a new roof put on in 1967. This one is only two inches to mock the image and the look of a sod roof. But Marshall, uh, the 12 inches thick was to actually would take and hold the sod house together. And a 12 inch thick roof is 7,800 pounds of sod above you. Again, that weight helped hold these walls together. Wow, and, and from what I understand, you've told me the first rain was critical, is that? Very critical, yes. The pioneers, when building a sod house, the most important thing was after the sod was built, you needed that hard rain to wash all the loose dirt away and seal the cracks and knowing that you had a quality home. So what about insects and some of the cracks and things like that? Well, and believe it or not, there was good to everything. Uh, I had the privilege of hearing the granddaughter speak in the early 90s, and in standing inside, you're going to see sheets tacked to the ceiling. Well, the purpose was to catch sod and bugs from falling on you. And as she gave the history that day, she rolled her eyes up at the sheets, looking back at all of us. Her comment was, yes, I remember grandmother talking about the snakes slithering across the sheets at night. <laughs> you did not kill a snake. They ate rodents. You didn't kill mud daubers on the exterior because they ate the spiders and bugs okay. living in the walls. So you took care of nature. Nature took care of you. It, I'm just thankful I live today. <laughs> yeah, it's a completely different way of life. So you mentioned that Ms. McCauley liked to decorate a little bit. How did she decorate maybe the outside of her home? Well, believe it or not, they would actually throw, the, they brought flower seeds down with them. 
And out here on the grasses and prairies, the best thing to do was throw the flower seeds on top of the roof so when the spring came, you had color added to the, the home with the flowers blooming on top. Wow, I bet that was a sight to see. Yes. So tell us a little bit about like actually making the bricks. Well, on the pioneers in doing such a thing, you had a sod plow. The sod plow was strictly um, for breaking the virgin soils. And the thing about it is the share blade on it is perfectly straight. Mm -hmm. So in plowing that furrow slice, it rolled the sod over so slowly that you had perfect strips of sod. Then they came back cutting those furrow slices into blocks, making sod blocks. And so from there, you would take and load them. Marshall McCulley actually went a mile north of here to uh, plow his sod because it was buffalo grass. Buffalo grass is very important on using on a sod house because it's very, very short stem grass. And at the same time, the root system to buffalo grass is over 12 inches deep. And that first six inches of the root system are very, very tight and very woven together. And that too would hold the, the house much better. Yeah, so it was a nice brick already because it has yes. the fiber in there and the soil. Exactly, exactly. It's definitely so, a lot of work back in those yes. days. And, and something that we don't think about anymore when we're considering putting sod in front of our house. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Not building a house out of sod. <laughs> Not quite. Renee, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of Oklahoma history thank with us. Thank you. Enjoyed having you here today. Garfield County at the OSU Extension Office and joining me is Jenny Gwinnup who is the County uh, Master Gardener President. Yes. And Jenny you guys have been busy out here it looks like. We this have is been. Part of your demonstration garden. Yes this is the start of our demonstration garden and we've been probably the last 20 years we started this organization and so this is the very beginning just what's around here around the Extension Office and we've started with a lot of Oklahoma proven plants and then we have just expanded over the last couple of years. So right here we're so. in full sun, surrounded by concrete against a brick wall. So we've got some really hardy plants yes. here. And, and there's a lot of color. A lot of color, especially right now with the heliotropes blooming and spreading, and it's just, you know, very attractive, I think. So, uh, if you're a lover of blue, which I am. Yeah. <laughs> so how many master gardeners do you have in this county right now? Uh, we have about 60 members okay. currently. So with 60 so. members, you couldn't just stop with this small of a garden, right? No, we <laughs> had to keep going, and yes, so we always have wonderful ideas from our gardeners, and they're just willing to share, and that just makes it special for all of us. And you've actually grown beyond the extension office to your yes. different demonstration yes, garden. Yes, right. So up by the extension office you had more of a landscape, but this is more demonstrating different ways of gardening. Exactly. You've got a keyhole uh, garden. We have a keyhole <laughs> garden. And as you know, we, you know, we put our um, grasses and other things mm -hmm. from our gardens in the center, and that leaches out to help fertilize the plants that are on the outside. And um, so we just tried different things, some radishes, some tomato plants. Um, some peppers that are recently planted. Yeah, they just got. They, they just got, got in this morning. It's with some marigolds, and so they with this wonderful. We're um, all wilting. We're a all bit. wilting a little bit. <laughs> so, um, and beyond us, you've got a pollinator garden. It looks like we over have there. a pollinator, a pocket po pollinator garden. So, and you yes. seeded that, or we seeded that. We we decided to put down some black tarp for several months, and kind of cook everything, get rid of the weeds. Uh -huh. And uh, then after that, we removed the tarp and started putting down, we used some Johnson seeds, wildflower seeds. And it's taken a couple seasons, but it's just, it's really beautiful and great for the pollinators. Which and just leads to a whole nother lesson with kids. I know you do a lot of kids programming and stuff yes. and are gonna do even more. It looks like you have a kid's garden behind us. We, we do have a children's garden we're very proud of. We're just kind of, it's in its infancy, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of things planned and we're excited about the lessons we're gonna be having out there. So what are so. what's some of the stuff that we can find over here? Well, this is our most recent flower bed. 
Um, we actually, we wanted to have a children's garden and we wanted it to be, it's actually planned for another area. Uh -huh. And then we decided this was the best location. So we had to move some things around that probably weren't appropriate for children's gardens, like a rose, rose bushes. Okay. And we had this area that to me looked like a butterfly. So we had a garden tour coming up last week and we decided let's just make it into the shape of a butterfly. So, you know, we, we dug it out and we put this, the stones around the edging and it planted several annuals as you can see in there. Well, it's definitely so. colorful and I know it will probably be attracting a few well, butterflies this well, summer we too. Hope so. So you've even got some games out here like the checkerboard and hopscotch. Yes, hopscotch for the kids, some activities. Um, we had another garden. This was where our roses were planted, uh -huh. but as, we, as I said, we needed to transfer them somewhere else. So we decided to do a direct seeding project. And here again, I kind of looked at the shape of the bed that we had originally and decided, kind of looks like a heart. <laughs> you so were inspired by I was the inspired. Landscape. And um, so we kind of just thrown some seeds down there. And it's just an inexpensive way to start a garden, and we'll see how they do. And you can and, see our little well, ladybugs kind of walking, their, making their way through there. It looks like there's some lines with sand. So yes. are those dividing them? Yes, we divided it up with sand, and so we kind of know. And then I marked it with your paint markers, or okay. paint stirs, um, to see how that would be. So we will see. Um, we also have a sensory garden. Our plans are to expand with this, but we want this for children to be able to touch and feel and smell. And uh, so this is the beginning of our sensory garden. So a lot have. of color and herbs. A lot of color and a lot of textures. herbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the plan. And so. then of course, no garden is complete with some without some oh, activity this for is kids. Our, one of my favorite additions to the garden is this beautiful labyrinth. And um, a little different from a maze is you have to start at one side and go all the way to the very center of uh -huh. it. So they follow so the brick uh, They follow path. the brick pass, and we've had lots of volunteers that came in and helped um, bringing their own bricks and somebody, a gentleman, that helped to create some bricks for us. So. Well, it's just beautiful. And what I yeah. love most about this is this is open to the public. A lot of your yes. plants, most of your plants are labeled mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people, you know, Enid has a different climate than some of the other Ex areas Exactly, of the state. so much even from Stillwater to Enid. Yeah. And so we try and have a variety of Oklahoma proven and so they can come and see what we have and what does well here in Enid. What works in the and, and, hot, and, dry, and windy the hot, dry, windy location out here. Well, so. thank you for sharing your garden with well, us. Well, thank you. So I'm glad you could be here. west of Alva, Oklahoma in Woods County and joining us today is Greg Highfield who is the OSU County Extension Educator for Woods County. Greg, what brings us out here is we wanted to kind of look at the ecology and the horticulture and unfortunately northwestern Oklahoma has experienced a lot of wildfires. Can you tell us a little bit about the history out here with that? Well we've had an interesting four years uh, beginning back in uh, 2015. Uh, when we had a wildfire in the northern part of Woodward County uh, that burned a significant number of acres, maybe uh, 20 to 30,000, uh, that wasn't as big as some of the recent fires, but certainly a significant event. Uh, we got it stopped before it got to the Cimarron River, which is Woods County, of course, uh, but uh, certainly a, a challenge back in 2015. Then in 2016, of course, was the Anderson Creek fire. Started just down the road here uh, where the Anderson Creek Bridge is, right on the highway, and burned a significant part of Woods County and, of course, on into Kansas. Uh, we spent a number of weeks uh, fighting wildfire, uh, working with the donors that, that sent us hay, and uh, helping producers uh, replace miles and miles of fence. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, of course, was uh, the fire out west in, in Beaver and Harper counties and uh, of course that did the significant damage up in Kansas uh, and uh, just significant uh, all around. Yeah. And then certainly here in uh, 2018, uh, Dewey County, Woodward County, those were uh, huge fires as well. Uh, 
and all the extension educators in this part of the state have been part of uh, supplying hay donation relief, uh, uh, manning those phones, right. and doing that uh, as a part of our efforts to, to help producers. And so it, it's been a, a busy four years here. Right. Uh, from an agriculture standpoint, uh, certainly uh, the difference between a wildfire and a prescribed burn is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, wildfires tend to be on 50 mile an hour wind days and not 20 mile an hour wind days and, and that just creates such a, a heat that uh, those are so significant and uh, uh, to talk about that would, you know, would, would talk about the, you know, losing fences, right. you know, these unplanned fires where we don't have fire breaks and, and, and uh, aren't in control like mm -hmm. we are in a prescribed burn. Uh, they're just so destructive. And so we've replaced miles and miles of fence, uh, different structures, replaced hay and all those types of things. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, right. certainly the effect on the landscape is much the same as a prescribed burn as far as decreasing the cedar trees that we have here and uh, being able to uh, cut them, stealing the water and, and increase grass production. Uh, these areas have responded wonderfully. Uh, uh, certainly we would have wanted a little more rain back in 17, right <laughs> after that 2000, uh, the Anderson Creek fire, uh, but uh, we're recovering nicely and, and uh, these pastures are doing a great job and again in their recovery efforts. Yeah, I mean looking behind us we see a lot of eastern red cedar skeletons if you will. Yes. And, uh, obviously this pasture was kind of getting a little out of control with the cedar trees but now it's transformed back to pasture and grassland. Certainly more productive and, and, and uh, again, yes, uh, is responding nicely. Uh, we did pick an area here that, that was heavier in trees. Even the you know, normal pastures that are managed uh, for cedars a, a little more intensely. Uh, certainly it, it took care of a lot of those cedar problems and uh, and prescribed burn people have a saying, any dead cedar tree is a, good. Is a good fire. So <laughs> we're, uh, you know, we're out to get them and, and uh, they're just encroaching and, and such a menace on our landscape. It, it's a real challenge to, to keep them under control. Because not only are they shading out plants, but they're also stealing the water from those plants, oh, the true. grasses that we would like to have. I think uh, they estimate 300 gallons a year uh, that they're stealing water out from under all these plants that obviously wouldn't be here mm -hmm. if they hadn't have lost the cedar co competition. So just a great um, resource and a tool. Land that we see that is managed under prescribed burning uh, tends to respond a little better to a burn than a wildfire because of the thatch, because of the different, uh, because of the way a wildfire goes through. Uh -huh. But that being said, it, it, it's still a positive. Right, right. With a wildfire, you don't necessarily know when that pasture has been burned less. Sure. There might be more fuel to sure. it. Prescribed land typically is burned more frequently. So Absolutely. Okay. As Again, as you look across this landscape that's covered with cedars, you know, five years ago would have had half the grazing Mm -hmm. uh, potential as it does today and just because of of the sheer volume of it and so and how, uh, how many years has it been since this burn what was uh, this year? this would have been 2016 so this would okay. be the second year second spring yeah. yes well Greg I know we often hear about the wildfires when they're happening but it's nice to take a look back and see the good that comes out of the devastation thank you for sharing with us great to be here Outside of Freedom, Oklahoma, and joining me today is Melinda Hickman, who is a biologist for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. And mm -hmm. Melinda, tell us why we're here. I'm so excited. <laughs> There's bats. <laughs> there, there are bats. Uh, this is an amazing area. You are in what's called the mixed grass uh -huh. prairie region. So we have short grasses and tall grasses. But as you can see behind us, we have this this gypsum topography. And because we have caves, 
we have bats here in this particular area. Okay, and we don't just have any normal bat here. Oh, heck no. Right, what bat is it that we're <laughs> looking at? That we're we'll looking up? at the Mexican free-tailed bat, uh -huh. which is a migratory bat, so it does not hibernate here in Oklahoma. Okay. It actually flies up from, believe it or not, Mexico, uh -huh. uh, to come up and, and, and breed and give birth to pups, and then the pups fly, and then they start to work their way back south. They are following insects. Now, all the bats that are here are actually female, is that correct? They are okay. all females, and not only are they all females, they were pregnant when they came to the Selman Bat Cave. Okay. And they, there's an amazing courtship that takes place as the male and females migrate north. Mm -hmm. And it's, in fact, it's the first they've been apart for a whole year the poor males and females and but as they start migration they're together again and a lot of courtship goes on a lot of mating um, about the middle of texas all of that changes the females that are pregnant continue migrating Generally speaking, they will return to the cave from which they were born, okay. and the males are footloose and fancy free for a whole nother year. To continue on. Absolutely. And so in six to seven weeks, you've got this, um, this amazing emergence of females and the pups, and here we have over a million Mexican free tail bats. That's a lot of bats. It's a lot of bats. <laughs> so we typically see them come out at dusk. Yes. Right. So or a um, little bit or a later before, or yeah, a little early. <laughs> yeah. So we try to time it about the right time. Yes. Um, and how long will that? Uh, last as they come out of the cave? Well, we we have been watching this for more than 20 years now, and when the pups, well, all the pups are flying, mm -hmm. it takes more than 45 minutes for them to all come out. Mm -hmm. And when you see how thick they are, yeah. and you do some a uh, math, mm -hmm. and 45 minutes of that, it is a lot of right, bats. Right. And it almost looks like smoke the way it they're does. coming out, and like a school of fish, basically. <laughs> oh, very aquatic. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> yes. So Melinda, when they start coming out of here, do they always go in the same direction? And what are they looking for? Insects, okay. I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely insects. <laughs> uh, they, they really will vary their pattern, and it's all about the moisture in the area surrounding. Mesonet okay. helps us uh, look at, there's three different stations. We can look at where the moisture level is, the highest level, and almost always the bats will head in that direction okay. because the insects that they really love are caught up in the, the higher elevations where that moisture is being worked on. Okay. So uh, because they hunt so high, they are eating beetles and they're eating moths oh. primarily. Okay. So unfortunately, they're not the bats that are eating the mosquitoes right. because they're not coming down low <laughs> enough. But we do have a lot of bats that are in Oklahoma that do. Yeah. But these these guys are eating those moths that are a real problem for agriculture, for um, our farmers who are growing corn in particular, the mm -hmm. corn earworm, okay. nasty, nasty pest. And that's what these guys love. Oh, excellent. So you mentioned we have other bats in the state. Now, this is kind of unique to the state in the fact that it's such a mass population. Absolutely. But we have a lot of other bats across we the did. state. Just How many? Oklahoma is so diverse in wildlife and plants. We have 24 different species and subspecies of bats that use Oklahoma at some point in their in their annual cycle. Okay. Melinda, I know a lot of homeowners, you know, people might be scared if they see bats around. What should they do if they see them or what should they think about them? Well, they should be really glad that they're there. Okay. Um, they are eating the mosquitoes that we don't like, the bugs that bother us in our gardens. What for Oklahoma, we have a few bats that are found all over the state, and they're the ones that like to be in our neighborhoods, okay. and they like trees. And our most common is the eastern red bat. And if you've ever seen the red coloration on a, on a red fox, mm -hmm. same, same color. beautiful okay. red color. And she hangs up in your tallest tree during the day, usually cottonwoods, sycamores. Are they a solitary bat then? Or? They are solitary. Okay. They're not colonial like our okay. Mexican free tail bats. So this is open to the public to come out. How, how does a, a person come and view these bats? Okay, so we have what we call the Selman Bat Watches, mm -hmm. and they take place in the month of July, you know, the hottest time of the year. <laughs> but that's when the, the females, the moms, and the, and the pups are, are flying, active. so it makes a really large, extravagant spectacle. Um, and 
to, to, to do that, you actually have to enter a, a registration form by mail, mm -hmm. and there's a registration period, but it always starts the Tuesday following the Monday Memorial Day. Okay. And it's about 10 business days to get your registration form in. It doesn't matter if you got it in the beginning of the period or after, because when that period is over, we actually conduct a drawing. Oh. And there's a preference point to it. Okay. If you have tried, and didn't get to go, your your preference is higher, okay. but if you've been in the past, then it's gonna be lower, okay. because we're trying to give everyone the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it just happens in the month of July. And only for a few nights a week, correct? It's two nights, uh, the Friday and Saturday, okay. the four weekends following the 4th of July holiday. Okay, well, Melinda, thank you oh, for sharing this with us, and let's sit so back exciting. and watch some bats, let's shall do, we? Let's do, let's do. And as we wrap up our Northwest Regional Tour, we want to say thank you to all the people that we met along the way and those who opened their home, their backyards, and their businesses to us. Without their generosity, we wouldn't be able to bring you the diversity that we experienced on this regional trip. And to our viewers, we want to thank you for joining along with us on our regional tour, and we hope that you take time to come explore Northwestern Oklahoma. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. <laughs>